All right, thank you guys. Um, as we dive into this sermon, God just put on my heart, and with what we picked, God's love. I want to share a story real fast. Uh, something when I uh, was a freshman in college, I you know, I made stupid decisions. How many? First of all, how many of you guys have made some dumb decisions? I see a lot of hands. That's good. That's good. Um, with these dumb decisions, obviously came consequences, but. <laughs> my parents were mad, and a little bit in this story, I was a freshman in college, it was my first year, I was at a junior college, I made a lot of friends, you know, we went out and hung out, did some, some crazy things, but we were, we were at a party, obviously, um, I made some stupid decisions, didn't, did some things that I probably shouldn't have done as a 19-year-old, and with that, my dad asked me, hey, what are you guys, what are you, what are you, what are you doing? And I, I told him beforehand, hey, I'm just hanging out with some friends. It's a little, it's like a, a camping trip, get together, we're going to build a fire, you know, having fun, right? I lied straight to his face. I, it was not something I should have done, obviously. And the next morning when we woke up, I had like 12 missed phone calls, and I was panicking. I was like, oh, God, oh, God, what's going on? I called him back, and he said, what were you guys doing? And I told him, same thing as last time. We were just hanging out with friends, camping. Again, I lied to him. When I got home a little bit later, my dad asked me one more time, what were you doing? I told him the same thing. And he said, okay, and walked away. Immediately from there, I regretted lying to my dad. I felt my heart sink. I felt this feeling of regret. It's most likely because it was the wrong thing to do, but I shouldn't have lied to him. It did not feel good to do that. The next day, I went to my dad's work, and I, I laid it all out, and I said, Dad, I'm sorry. That's not what I was doing. I told him what we were doing, and sorry for getting emotional, but he looked at me and he said, it's okay, and he gave me a hug. I thought that he was going to be ready with a machete and a hammer to kill me. <laughs> but he didn't let the fact that I lied to him over and over again and doing something wrong keep him from loving me the same way he has. And you know, that isn't what I was expecting. I was expecting punishment. I was expecting a consequence. But instead, love was there. Forgiveness was there. Grace was there. That same kind of love that my dad showed me is super similar. It's actually just similar to what God has for us. Most of the times we turn away, we do things we're not supposed to, we fall off of our path, but God is still there waiting for us with arms wide open. As we continue in our sermon series today, Yahweh, uh, you guys can go ahead and open up your Bibles to Exodus uh, chapter 4, or chapter 34, sorry. Um, the past two weeks we've been talking about the qualities of, of God. The, the slow to anger, we've been talking about his compassion, grace. Uh, this week, we're going to be focusing on his abounding love and faithfulness. This week, we're going to be picking up in verse 6, uh, part of it, talking about that abounding uh, love and faithfulness. If, let's look at verse 6 real fast. It says, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. In this verse, we're looking at three words. Abounding love, and faithfulness. It's pretty easy, right? For a little bit of context uh, in this section of Exodus, we see Moses had just broken the first set of tablets out of anger because of what the Israelite people were doing. These, the tablets were the Ten Commandments. He was coming back down from the mountain after he had just writ, wrote them, and he sees the Israelites worshiping a golden calf. And he's like, what are you guys doing? That is like, he got super angry, super frustrated, and he broke these tablets. He was upset. He threw him on the ground. He then broke the golden calf that the Israelites were also worshiping. He was frustrated. He was not slow to anger. He was angry. He confronted the Israelites and told them that they committed a great sin. The next day, he went back up to the mountain to intercede on behalf of the Israelites, apologizing and asking God for forgiveness for what they had done. And from this, God tells Moses to create two new tablets, and the, the same as the original, which he did. And then he went back up to the mountain, which leads us to where we are now. 
God telling Moses in verse 6, the same verse we just read, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. God is talking about himself in this, and he is saying, this is what I am. I am abounding in love and faithfulness. Today, we're going to be focusing on those three words, and we're going to break down that phrase, abounding love and faithfulness. You're going to hear it a lot today, so I'm sorry. Um, as we dive deeper into the meaning of God's perspective and what that means to us. So let's start with the word love. That'll be the first one. The literal definition of the word love is an intense feeling of deep affection. That is what most people use for the word love. That's what most of us know it as, a feeling that we have for one another, a feeling that maybe we have for a friend, for families, for a husband or wife, significant other. Or... Sometimes it's a materialistic thing in this world. Maybe it's video games. Maybe it's playing pickleball. Maybe it, whatever that looks like that you're spending so much time and in diving into. that You could say that you love that too, sure. When we talk about the love that God shows or that he has for us, it's somewhat similar to that love. But it is so much more than we can comprehend. It is so much more important than a human love. God's love is different from ours, and it's unchanging, it's unconditional. In our scripture today that we see, we see a Hebrew word called, pronounced, hesed, that means kindness or, good, or goodness, and when it's used in the context of our scripture today in Exodus 34, it's literally translated to loving kindness. Love that God has for us throughout the entire book of the Bible. We see that same kind of love as an unchanging love, as a love that will always be the same, that will always reach out to us, that will never fail, that is unconditional. That's a pretty amazing love. Even when we mess up, I mean, just in the scripture where I was talking about the Israelites messing up, worshiping a golden calf, God still loved them. He forgave them. He loved them. Take the fall of mankind, for example. When Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, God was, God was upset. In Genesis 3, yeah, they messed up. God had to kick them out of the garden. But at the same time, even in their sin and their disobedience, when he punished them and taking out of the garden, he did not leave them. He clothed them. He guided them from that. He did not leave them by themselves. We see that in 21 through 23 of Genesis chapter 3. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us. Knowing good and evil, he must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. Yes, God removed them from the garden. Yes, he punished them. Yes, we see his anger in that. But he also helped them. He also forgave them and was there for them. He didn't just leave them idly by. He didn't just leave them alone to fend for themselves. Because without God, I mean, there really wasn't winning. Even if Adam and Eve couldn't see him, God was still working behind the scenes. God was still there even if they couldn't feel him even if they couldn't see him. The, books, the book of Exodus shows us time and time again when the Israelites disobey, when they go somewhere else, when they doubt God, when they question God over and over again, the Israelites continue to do the same thing. I mean, he delivered them from Egypt. He saved them from the Egyptians. But yet they're like, you know what? I'd rather have been there. I don't want to be out here. I'm, I'm hungry, God. What, what's going on? He, they questioned his power. They questioned him. He deliver, delivered the Israelites out to a promised land, but they still did wrong. They still worship idols, and they still doubted God. Then when we get to the judges later uh, in the Old Testament, they weren't any better. Samson, for example, he fell to temptation. He lost his way. He cut his hair. He broke rules. He doubted, and he also disobeyed. Even there, you have kings. You have King Saul who disobeyed the Lord 
uh, and the prophet Samuel wouldn't let him, wouldn't let him see and intercede. Um, he rejected him as, as king. King Saul also disobeyed. Many kings disobeyed. The Israelite people were known for disobeying, were known for not following the rules. You also see King David. I mean, we all know what King David did, right? I mean, I, adultery. He laid hands on another man's wife. He sent a man to die when he found out. King David wasn't any better. And all of this led to be known as something called the 400 years of silence. And it was a time period where the Israelites did not hear from God for 400 years. Now, it could have been because they doubted over and over and over. And were like, God, we don't want you. We want someone here that we can see, someone we can listen to. And he was like, you know what? Okay, fine. So 400 years of silence followed this. And honestly, God is God. If he wants to be silent, he can. Who are we to question him? But he didn't. They continuously doubted and disobeyed God, so he was silent. He did not leave them alone, though. He was still working behind the scenes within that 400 years of silence, preparing for a Savior, preparing for who we know as John the Baptist to come, and then led to Jesus entering our world, who is our Savior. For thousands of years, there was a repetitive disobedience and rebellion towards God. But even in all of that, God never gave up on Israel. And you know, it's, it's the same for us. Throughout all of Israel, they wanted more. They wanted more. They kept asking for more. Regardless of what they had already been shown and given, they asked for more. Time and time again. God never gave up on his people. That same thing could be said for us and is still happening today. He's not giving up on his people. God does not turn his back on you, even when you don't feel it or when you don't see him working, he's still here. All of the time, I'm sure at some point in your life you felt ignored by God. I'm sure that you felt like you weren't hearing what he had for you. I'm sure like you felt that you were abandoned. But I want you to know that that's not true. Even when we don't see it or feel him working, he's still working. This is the love that God has for us. An unconditional love that no matter what you do, what you say, what you believe or don't believe, God still loves you. There's nothing you can do to keep his love from loving you. God will always love you. God's love is also sacrificial. Now, the only love that can even come close to this may be a parent's love. Parents, you guys sacrifice so much for your kids. You guys do so much for us, teaching us, helping us, forgiving us, providing for us. I don't know a love that is, comes anywhere near close to God's love like a parent's love could. It's sacrificial in the way, and when we're sinful in nature, God's still there. He sent his one and only son to die on a cross for you and me so that we could be saved. I don't know any of us that can make that decision. I don't know how we can make a decision to give up our, our children for that. We see that actually in John three sixteen, this verse right here. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that, however, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Right here in this verse, we see his love for us. We see that unconditional love. We see the sacrificial love that is never ending. A love that can't come close to our comprehension. There's a Greek word that we've used a lot here at Care City. It's called agape. This love, agape, means unconditional sacrificial love. This Greek word is used so many times in the Bible. This is God's love, never ending sacrificial and unconditional. You know, there's a song that I'm reminded of, Reckless Love. I'm sure you guys know that. It literally talks about God leaving a group of 99 people to go find the one every single time. That he leaves a good group to go find an outcast. That he leaves the family that's here to go find the lost child. 
that's our God. And with this Greek word agape, we talk about the word, that's because the love of Jesus is such an amazing, important thing. And we say that a lot. And all that we do, that we learn, that we base and teach on is, is God's love. It all comes around and we teach about that. That is love. But going back to that same passage that I had for you guys, there's also two other words that we're going to talk about today. Remember back to the verse for the day, Exodus 34, verse 6. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Yes, there are two other words. Let's talk about abounding now. Well, what does abounding mean? Okay, these two words. One of them connects and supports that love that we were talking about, and that's abounding in this, or abundant. If you guys don't know what abundant means, it means a lot, great, much, many. The Hebrew word that we're going to use for today is rob. This means much or great. For us, it's abundant, which is just a bigger way of saying much or great. So in Exodus 34, verse 6, God talks about himself having an abundant love, a, a lot of love, a great amount of love, a never-ending love. His abounding love, abundant to us, means existing or available in large quantities. Plentiful. And yes, that's what we could describe as God's love. But also, God's love isn't something that we can fully comprehend. I know that we talk about it a lot of times. I know that we think we can understand that. But we are never going to fully understand and comprehend the true love that God has for us because it's that abundant sacrificial love. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross shows us that God sent his own one and only son who was perfect to earth. Jesus was perfect and he came down to a not perfect world. He gave up being in heaven with God so that he could die on a cross for us. God, Jesus, he loves us so much. Because of that. And I know I'm saying love a lot, but I mean, that's what we're talking about today. God did this because he loves you that much. Because he loves us that much. An overflowing, never-ending love, just like it's unconditional and unchanging. It's never-ending. From the very beginning of all time, whenever God says, even before we were created, before the world was created, God loved us. Even when you've past, and in the future, God will still love you. Let's look back at Exodus 34, verse 6 again, and, and reread, and Andy, Andy passed in front of Moses, proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. We just talked about abounding. Let's talk about his faithfulness now. For this word, faithfulness, the Hebrew word that we're going to use for today is emeth which means firmness, faithfulness, or truth. And in our scripture today, it's used as faithfulness, a promise, truth, something that God keeps for us. He keeps and makes promises for us, and he has never let us down in that area. God's faithfulness, yes, it's similar to his love. It's unchanging in nature. It will always be the same, and it will never give up on you. He's always there waiting for us, even in doubt, even in the unknown, even in times where you feel like you don't feel him, he's waiting. His faithfulness is still there. It's still promised. The book of Exodus is a perfect example of God's faithfulness. We see Moses and the Israelites, and we're going to look here in chapter 6, the promise that God had for the Israelites in chapters, chapter 6 of Exodus, verses 6 through 8. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession." I am the Lord. God's faithfulness is a promise. He 
he promised the Israelites safety, deliverance, and he gave it to them. Every time the Israelites doubted and kept saying, God, we need more. We need more. I need, we, need to know you, we need to know that you are real. We're doubting. God, I don't know what to do. And he provided he delivered them from the Egyptians. And you know, for us, it's the same thing. We doubt. We struggle with that. But the book of the Bible is perfect example of God's faithfulness. We see Jesus' sacrifice, a promise for us, salvation. And it was delivered. God delivered his son on a cross to be sacrificed for our sins. That's the abounding love and faithfulness that God has, has for us in the resurrection. The ultimate sacrifice, Jesus' death, which saved us, which allowed us to have a relationship with our Father. Forgiving us of all of our sins and giving us eternal life. That's the ultimate kind of love. That's the love that I don't know how to compare to. That's that love that I can't comprehend. That is God's faithfulness and his love. Sacrificial, abundant, unconditional, faithful. That he will always provide for us and it's unchanging in its very nature. That is always working behind the scenes even when we can't see it and when we can't feel it. Maybe you're thinking this morning though that you don't know that kind of love or feel that you aren't worthy of that kind of love. Or maybe that he wouldn't do all of this for you. Well, I'm here to tell you that that's not true. I'm here to tell you that because of what happened 2,000 years ago, those exact beliefs that you might be feeling are false. You have a God who loves you, cares for you, and will never give up on you. He gave up his one and only son for you. Each and every one of us has God's love holding us, supporting us. And even if you haven't heard about this or don't know what I'm talking about, we're about to get into a time of worship again. I challenge you guys to come to know our Father. We have plenty of leaders here, plenty of pastors and plenty of elders that would love to talk to you about that. God's love is compassionate, slow to anger, abundant, and faithful. And even with this, there's another side to that, right? That same love that we are given, we're supposed to show. It's not just about us receiving that love and all right, God, we're ready. We're, we're gonna stay here and, and be here. No, we're supposed to show that to others who don't know his love. That it is a love of compassion, an agape, a said kind of love. And then if you need an example of what not to do, look at Moses. Look at his outburst, his reaction. When he saw the Israelites worshiping and doing wrong, instead of forgiving them, he got frustrated and broke things. He went in front of them and told them, you guys were doing wrong. Broke the calf in front of them and was very frustrated. That's an example of what not to do. When he came down from the mountain that first time, he was angry and he was furious. But even in that, God was loving. God was passionate and forgiving. He was patient and he was kind and he was slow to anger. We as Christians are supposed to exhibit this kind of love towards others. We are com commanded to love others this way. Now, I understand that it might be hard. It might be a little uncomfortable. But that's that kind of sacrificial love that we have to have. I mean, why shouldn't we? We have a father who gave his son. We have a father that gave up his son for us. It should break our hearts that we know people that don't know Jesus' love. can die and God can give up his son on a cross for us, sacrificing himself for our sins, 
why can't we give up a little bit of time? Why can't we start loving others just a little more? Why can't we stop being selfish? Maybe it's focusing on people around you more. Maybe it's giving up some of that personal time that you love so much. And I know that it might be hard, it might be frustrating at times, but that's what we're called to do. As Christians, that is what we are called to do to love others. Remember what Jesus did for you and ask yourself, am I living as Jesus Christ is living right now? Am I giving up the time? Am I doing what he would do? Or am I not loving others with a full heart? Because I promise you, if we can learn to love like this, if we can learn to love how Jesus loved us, it's gonna change everything. Going back to that story of my dad and whenever, obviously, I did some stupid things. When I messed up and lied to my dad, I had no clue what he was gonna do. Again, I thought that he was ready, you know, machete in one hand, hammer in the other. I thought it was over. But that isn't what happened. Instead, he opened his arms. He forgave me with a welcome home, son. And that's the exact same thing that Jesus will do for each and every one of you and people that know him. Even, even if they don't know him, when they come to know him, he's waiting with arms wide open. So my challenge for you guys today, do you know the love that God has for you? Do you know how faithful and truthful he is to you? And if not, here's that challenge. Start a relationship with Jesus. Get to know him more. And if you don't this morning, as we're about to worship, I'm gonna be in the back. Come talk to me. If you don't know the love that God has for you, start a relationship with Jesus. And maybe you do know that love, but maybe you need a reminder that you have to show that same kind of love to other people. Because it doesn't just stop with us being loved. We have to love others the same way Jesus loved us. Let's pray.